So we're going to go ahead and get started, and, and you may remember we, we talked, uh, uh, looked a, a lot at 1 Corinthians 11 last week. So um, turn back there just for a second, um, 1766. First Corinthians 11, 1766, and uh, we got through most of, okay, quiz time, and some of you aren't here, so then you have a legitimate excuse. What were the three things St. Paul encourages us to do for proper reception of the Lord's Supper? Ooh, come on, come on. Examine ourselves, Examine ourselves beforehand, yes, the, very good. All right, Barbara gets a bonus a point. Yeah, she gets a star. <laughs> Gold star. Who else? Two more. Mm -hmm. And you, you got to pass, so you're good. <laughs> Don't get drunk. Don't get drunk. <laughs> well, he yes, he does. All right. Yes, you're right. I'm, I'm going to give you a half a star. <laughs> All right. The other two, uh, do this, keep on doing this in remembrance of me. So, you know, who are we focused on? We're focused on Christ and what he did for us. And, um, Whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, you know, so it's recognizing what we're receiving. It's remembering this is his gift of himself, his body and his blood given and shed for us. And, and we kind of went through, um, emphasize real presence, that in, with, and under, yeah, Jesus' body and Jesus' blood is there. Um, yeah, and take a look at verse 31. So he, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 31. Um, but if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. And that's an interesting thing. So the self-examination process truly is good for us because if we judge ourselves, we will not come under judgment. So tell me what that means. Yeah, if we, if we are searching ourselves for a sin, doing that self-examination process, then that sin cannot conquer us. Because f key step, um, uh, first step of AA, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, is what? Admitting you have a problem. First step of overcoming a sin is to admit I have a problem with that sin. If I don't admit it, it controls me. And by the way, have you, for example, I'm just throwing one out. Have you ever known someone that... Lies come out of their mouth consistently. I mean, it's not really, it's to everybody. It's just, they're in that habit, and they don't see it as a problem. If they did, that would be the first step to overcoming it. If we judge ourselves, if we, if we go through that regular time of self-examination, that's spiritually beneficial, because then we can nip it in the bud. Famous theologian that I'm quoting, who is that? Barney Fife, yes, uh, Barney Fife is a famous theologian. You know, because sin, you become a slave to sin. It will control you. That's what Jesus says, and it does. But we can nip it in the bud if we recognize it early and take it to the cross. You know, take it to the cross. So um, take it to the Lord. So that is a, just a key part of it. All right, so now, but go, I wanted to get that in, and then I wanted you to turn to 1 Corinthians 10, not too far away. Um, and I just wanted to point out one little passage there. So verses 16 and 17 of 1 Corinthians 10, that's 1765. Um, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one loaf. Now, there's a couple key things there. First of all, in notice in verse 16, how many things are mentioned? What are we receiving physically there? The body and the blood. Your body and blood and the bread and wine. You know, it's all four. And I just wanted to point that out. <laughs> The, the scripture is very obvious about what we receive in Holy Communion, but it's easy to say, okay, well, that can't really be, so then we're going to try to explain it away. But when you take part in the Lord's Supper, you are receiving. Um, we're looking at 1 Corinthians 10 on page 1765. 
Um, by the way, that was a good year. I celebrated my 10th birthday then. Yeah. Yeah, you look that old. That's what they're thinking. <laughs> I can believe that. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's a participation in the body and blood of our Lord, but the bread and wine are still there too. So I just point that out. We, we talked about the three views of the Lord's Supper. Um, to me, this and 1 Corinthians 11 really define what, it, what we receive. Now, there's that other part, though, verse 17. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. So what, it, what, what is that kind of saying about communion there? Because there is one loaf, we're one body. Yeah, it, it's a family thing. It's a family thing. And, and, and you can think of it, uh, so oh, I guess I can say this, with, I'll probably get in trouble anyway, but that's okay. So uh, last night, uh, um, we uh, went to eat with my daughter Mary's boyfriend and her, his parents, second time. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> getting kind of nervous. <laughs> Not really. He's, an, he's a really neat guy. I said that on camera, so if you're watching. <laughs> um, but the, the, the interesting thing is, you know, um, my sister-in-law, Deb, was there. I was there, Denise, Mary, and then the three of them, seven of us. And, it, and it's very interesting. They're all passing their food around and saying, do you want to try this? Do you want to try that? And, and they're all doing that. They were all, you know, and I'm thinking, I'm not sharing mine. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no one wanted mine, so I'm on that. This, we went to Noodles or Noodles and Company or something like that down in Gastonia. And it's mainly a pasta place, as you would guess. So um, pasta is not on my approved protein high diet. So I got sides of grilled chicken and meatballs. Well, that was good, but there's no way I'm, sh I don't want any of your pasta and you're not getting any of my protein, you know. <laughs> I didn't fit in, <laughs> but, but it, it's kind of interesting. We're all sharing one meal, and you don't mind doing that, you know, and, and they're all eating out of the same bowl because it's kind of like family. And do you do that? Denise and I, we used to order two different things um, that we both like, and then we could try each other's, right? Did you ever do that? Or is, yeah. I always liked that because Denise never ate her whole meal, and then I would get a meal and a half, so <laughs> it really worked out good. Uh, yeah. Anyway, but so this oneness part is, is a real thing. So when we commune, we are communing with Jesus Christ himself. It's that element, but it's also this. It's, it's the oneness thing. So one of the things I, I always want you to, to keep in mind, you know, we, we have you commune, we call them by tables, even though there's no table up there. But, you know, we are coming as a, a group somewhere, 18, 20, whatever they, I don't know what the ushers put up there but something like that. And, and, and my hope is that we're recognizing that um, this is my family, my church family. And so sometimes people don't like how long our communion service is. And I mean, I can understand that, I really do. However, to me, that can be a very valuable time. So what do we do during communion, let's say after we've received communion? One, you can sing hymns of praise to God, and, and some of those are directly related to communion, you know, which is good. Um, but some of them are just, I'll put amazing grace in there, or how great thou art, or something. You can just sing songs of praise to God, so that's, that's a good thing. When you first come back, I hope you offer a prayer of thanks. But what I like to encourage people to do, you may not know everybody by name, um, but pray for the people that are taking communion because that's your family too, where there, there's a oneness there. And, and you can pray for them. Now, some people you'll know, and you might know specifically, oh, there's some, I need to pray for um, Bobby Sue Chandler having eye surgery tomorrow. Okay. Now, if you know who Bobby Sue Chandler is now, you know, well, that's okay. She's an eight o'clock service person. <laughs> so, but you can, you can pray for her. You know, but the people you know, you can specifically, as you see them go up, as you see them kneel, you can pray for them. And if you don't know them, you can still pray for them. 
You know, if you see someone wearing a boot, you might not know who they are, but uh, you, can, you can say a prayer for me that uh, I would listen to Denise and do the things I'm supposed to. That's, that's tough. But so there's this oneness factor, too. We commune together. Um, and if you think of it as family, so, all right, well, look at, look at your handout. Yeah, look at your handout. So, um, so I'm, I'm go to the second page because we really talk good about the first page. So notice the, and I'm just looking at the paragraph titles, um, the section titles, real presence. So in, in the Lord's Supper, did you grab one or where, where were they out? All right, were there still some back there? I got them more. I just put some. Yeah, there. there. Well, if there is one out there. Yeah, yeah, that's. Yeah. Anybody else didn't get one? I only got one page. Thank you. Do you want that one page too? Um, sorry. Right. <laughs> can take notes on. It. <laughs> yeah, it gets hard on the second page then. Okay, so real presence, um, um, that this is my body, this is my blood. So we talked about that. Notice God's guarantee. So that, that's why we do the Lord's Supper. This is the way God overwhelmingly shows us that we are forgiven and that he still loves us. Because as we come forward confessing our sins, Jesus gives us the gift of his body, the gift of his blood, and says... Um, this is the body that was nailed to a cross for the forgiveness of your sins. This was the, the blood that was shed for you for the remission of sins. And, I mean, it's designed to take away that nagging doubt. So, all right, there are some things I did as a teenager and a college student that I'm not proud of. I'm not going to go into great detail, but I just let me say that, okay? Um, now, I know all of you were almost perfect as young adults, so I, I'm sure you can't relate. Well, Scott, I'm not sure, because <laughs> Barbara's right there. <laughs> she gave you away, I'm sorry. And Travis, your dad rolled his eyes. I don't know what that means. <laughs> oh, that could be. No, that could be. But, um, you know, there are times, you know, 20 years after the fact, I feel guilty again about stupid stuff I did. And I knew better. And it's easy to start beating yourself up again. Now, I'm going to tell you, I've confessed those sins to God. And I have the assurance of his promise. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I have that promise. But sometimes you still don't feel. And part of our mistake is we take feelings as truth, don't we? So... Let's suppose you enter a room and you hear two people laughing and then they stop when, and they turn and look at you. What do you feel? They were talking about me. Now, what are the odds that they were actually talking about you? Slim to none. But, <laughs> but I mean, we do. We take our feelings as reality. And, and if I feel like the, you know, this, then that's got to be true. And that's what we do. So we feel guilty 20 years after the fact. We've confessed it. And we assume God hasn't forgiven us, that he won't forgive us, that he, he can't forgive us. And the Lord's Supper is designed to say, yes, he can. And here's the proof. The body of Christ shed for you, or the body of Christ nailed to the cross for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. That's the proof. It's God's guarantee of forgiveness. So that's, that's why it's necessary. All right, then look at the next page. So that says page 36. It would be page 3 of your handout, but it says page 36. Um, notice who the Lord's Supper is for. So the Lord's Supper is for sinners. So let's imagine you had no sin problem at all for the last six months. By the way, that would be awesome. <laughs> um, would you need to take communion? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, probably because uh, arrogance is probably one of your sins. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, if you, don't have, if you don't think you have a sin problem, don't take communion. In fact, you know, there are people, I've told people as a pastor, I don't want you to take communion right now. Why? Because they insisted that wasn't sin. 
This might have said differently, but they weren't ready to repent of it. So the Lord's Supper is for sinners who know they are sinners. You know, if I'm a Pharisee busy patting myself on the back, I, I, one, I don't need the Lord's Supper, and two, I shouldn't take the Lord's Supper because I'm not ready for it. So the Lord's Supper is for sinners. Perfect people don't need assurance of forgiveness. Lord's Supper is for believers. So by believers, we mean, first of all, believers in Jesus Christ. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, I don't know why you'd want to take the Lord's Supper anyway, quite honestly. I mean, that makes no sense because um, this is his sacred meal, you know. But it's also for believers in the sacrament. So, you know, I, I told you that the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, we have those policy statements in the bulletin and we say things like if you haven't uh, been confirmed in a Lutheran church please come talk to one of the pastors beforehand. Um, now why do we do that? We do that because we want to make sure that you know what you're receiving, that you recognize that it's the body and blood of our Lord, one of the three things. So that's all we're doing. We're, we're not judging you to be less than us, we're not saying anything about how wonderful you are, um, but we're saying we want to make sure you know what the sacrament is because the Corinthians, part of the problem, they had, you know, this, they were divided and letting their division ruin their fellowship. But the other problem was they were hearing, this is my body, this is my blood, and they didn't even believe it. They didn't recognize it. They took it as just snack time, you know, cheese and wine time kind of, uh, you know, they took it as a nothing. Well, when, when, when you hear, this is my body, this is my blood, I want you to know what it is so that it will be a valuable gift to you. So that's, that's why we do that. Um, I, 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 wish, I wish people would talk to me. Sometimes people will, will read that statement in the bulletin. I've had at least two people leave the church without even sitting down, well, getting up right after they sat down because they read that statement while they were sitting in the pew. It's like, I'm not a bad guy to talk to. You guys have talked to me. You tell him. You know, you know he's, he's kind of nice, a little strange. You can tell him that. That's okay. That would be truthful. But um, so, yeah. And then the Lord's Supper is, is a family thing, too. It's for the family of believer. We commune with each other. There's this oneness here. And, and I hope that's part of what you're celebrating. By the way, one of the things that our, our um, theologians have often discussed now, the classic shape of a communion rail is in a semicircle. Now, St. John's is kind of a semicircle, meaning it's got angles, it's not really. But, you know, where's the other half of the circle? It's behind the altar. It's behind the altar in heaven. And so one of the things we talk about, you know, as we commune, all those who've gone before us in the faith, they're gathered around the altar of Christ too. And, and, and I'm going to tell you, I receive a great deal of comfort knowing my mom and my dad, who I communed with for many, many years, um, at uh, the church I grew up in, they had, it, it was kind of a full circle actually, because uh, it went on all sides of the, uh, of the altar, um, but uh, it wasn't quite a circle, it was still angles and stuff, because it's more stop, shine, stop sign shaped. Um, but but the, I, I kind of like the, the half circle because it reminds us of the other half that's there, too. Um, and, and that's pretty cool, I think. I have right. Yes, ask questions. So, I was just so you know, I'm coming over from the ELCA. Yes. So when my kids were born in the ELCA, we didn't commune them until they went to confirmation. Right. And then that kind of changed in the last several years. When does the Missouri Senate commune? All right, so it's not a hard and fast. So in other words, the Missouri Synod as a whole doesn't say you must be 14 before you can be, you know, uh, confirmed. Um, so each congregation kind of establishes their own. St. John's is the third oldest church in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, which means we've been around forever and <laughs> 200 and, um, soon to be 25 years, 224 years this year. Um, and that means that we have years of tradition and we don't change from <laughs> centuries of tradition real, real easily. We, we do change, don't get me wrong, because in the 20 some years I've seen, we've changed. But we're very traditional when it comes to confirmation. So we still have, we, have, we had a seventh and eighth grade communion process when I, uh, when I first started here. And I asked them to start a sixth grade as part of that. So it's a three year program. 
Um, but we still do that. Now, some churches do early communion, so say around fifth grade, they'll take a crash course, not on all the catechism, but just on communion, basically, and then they'll start taking communion earlier. St. John's follows that traditional pattern of you know, years of study. So Matt teaches sixth grade, that's uh, um, kind of overview of the Bible. Um, Pastor Laguton teaches the seventh grade class, which is looking at the six chief parts taught in the catechism. And then I teach the eighth grade class, you just finished it, woohoo. She didn't think she'd survive for a while. It was tough, it was touch and go. But um, and in that, it's still the catechism, but I never get through all six parts, so we do like three and a half parts is all I can get through in a year, because we're really going in depth. So, uh, you know, I, I, my goal there, they've already got the overview in seventh grade. Now we're gonna look at 10 Commandments in depth. We're gonna look at uh, uh, Apostles' Creed in depth, and we're gonna look at communion in depth. And we'll, we'll talk about prayer, and we'll talk about uh, baptism some, but those three, because as we get ready for First Communion and, and a life of discipleship, that's where I really want to focus. So I, I'm kind of, you know, we didn't want it to be the exact same each year because that's, that's a waste of time. So I, I do things a little differently. But, but does that, you know, in some churches when you're in, uh, if you're old enough to eat solid food, you can receive communion up at the rail. Is that true? It is, in, in some Lutheran churches. That's the way it went. It went from that to all the way to like five years of age to start receiving. Yeah, and, and I kind of have problems with that because if you think of the three things, you get, you're remembering Jesus Christ, you're examining yourself beforehand, and you're recognizing what you're receiving. Now, quite honestly, Clark could probably do that. You know, so if, if I wanted to, I could make child by child. Maybe, you know, you, you could do that. So I, I don't think there's anything magical about age 14. But I'm not sure, you know, a, a four or five year old is going to be able to do those three things. So we're erring on the side of caution, you know, because we want them to understand and to be able to take it in a way that it's a, a true blessing to their faith. But, you know, I, I really don't have a problem if, if someone said, well, we need to do confirmation earlier and uh, so in uh, fifth and sixth grade we'll do confirmation. Okay, that probably would be okay. As long as you give me the flexibility to say he's not ready or she's not ready. Because it should never be about age anyway. It should be about the ability to examine yourself in light of the Ten Commandments, the ability to recognize what you're receiving. You know, all those things, that's the key part of what it takes to make the Lord's Supper. All right, good questions. Other questions? I like that. Yes? What was it if you gave it to a young kid and they, uh, I forgot what I read here now, if you're not ready, you take the communion. Uh, yeah, so you could, uh, you know, then in 11 it says you can, um, e eats and drinks judgment on himself, meaning it harms their faith. So if, if you go forward and you don't understand that I am receiving Christ's body and blood, if you don't believe that, then it becomes snack. And then probably that mindset will be yours for the rest of your life, you know. Um, so, I, you know, eats and drinks judgment on himself. And that doesn't mean you're going to hell with do not pass go, do not collect $200. It's not that type of thing. It's that you're harming your faith. And, you yeah, know, which one are you looking at? Uh, 27, uh, whoever eats in an unworthy manner. Yeah, sinning against the body and blood of our Lord. Yeah. That kid or the person that gave it to <laughs> understanding. Yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> yeah, but I, I really blame the church, meaning the leadership that thinks this is a great thing. Because what it's doing, it's, it's not following scripture. So, I, you know, you, Roman Catholic churches, what day do, when do they do first communion? I think first grade or second grade, something like that. Um, I think that's pushing it. Could you do it? You know, I really could, I, I know some churches that do fifth grade early communion. I'd probably be okay with that as long as it's not automatic guaranteed you're fifth grade, you get to take communion. I want to know, you tell me what communion is. I want to know, um, uh, how, how are you doing this week in light of the Ten Commandments? And I want to hear them say it. I want to hear that they can apply those to themselves. Because it's really easy to apply the Ten Commandments to others, isn't it? <laughs> it's a whole nother ball game to apply it to me. And, and that's all of us. All right. So good questions. What else? So what chapter or verse 31 is saying 
All right. We judged ourselves. We yeah, because if we go self-examination, then we'll never come under the ultimate judgment, God's judgment at the end of time. You know, if you're judging your sin and repenting of it, that sin can't destroy your faith. You know, you're, you won't be judged by God. You know, when we talk about judgment day, when, when Christ comes back, are we afraid of that? No. You know, do you see the candy bar commercial? You know, where they say, if you're going to be waiting in line a long time, and there's this long line of people waiting to go over the entire list of sin when you get into heaven. How, how many of your sins is God going to go over with you when you make it into heaven? Zero. Why? They're forgiven. He doesn't know them. He, he, the Bible says they're behind his back. You, know, you remember when, well, I'm, I'm sure you guys were never this way, but people used to slap me on the back and say, Hi, Scott, it's so good to see you. And then people would start kicking me. Why? Yeah, they put a sign back there, kick me. <laughs> you know, ha, 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 that was real funny. You know, you can't see behind your back. And that's the whole point. God doesn't know our sin. We're forgiven. Scott, you never did that, did you? Okay, good. I was just telling you, son did it. Oh, that's great. I love that. <laughs> yep. Uh, all right. All right, so then um, look at uh, what page 37. So, so um, here, here's one way of preparing for communion. And uh, notice these are three questions you could ask as part of your preparation process. Am I truly sorry for my sins? So that, there's two steps in that. One, do I recognize the sin in my life? So have you paused? And, and, and if you think about it, like, if you just take Eighth Commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness, and then think about gossip and lying and et cetera, et cetera, could, will you probably find something this week that you, uh, or last week, that you might have had a problem with the Eighth Commandment? Almost always. You know, and, and one by one. So murder, yeah, I didn't murder anyone, but was I angry with anyone? Was I harsh with anyone? Did I say while driving, you idiot. Uh, you, <laughs> even if no one hears you, I said it. You know, um, you, know you can go through um, and, you know, so you, do you recognize sin in your life? And if so, are you sorry for it? Meaning, am I willing to change? So that's question three. Am I sorry for it? Then I need to be willing to fight to change. As God assures me that he continues to love me and forgive me, I don't just keep doing that. I strive to change. Now, will that be easy to change? So I, I know some people that were in the military that in the military they talked a certain way. Colorful expressions. All right, you get what I'm saying? And then they come home and um, mom and dad did not raise them to talk in that colorful way. And so, but they're in, used to it, and then it just kind of happens, and it happens. And mom still washes out the mouth of a 30-year-old. That does happen sometimes. And, you know, and it's like, you really want to change, but the habits, so, you know, I'm not saying it's always easy to change, but do you want to? I'm not, I'm not making anyone promise, oh, yeah, I'll be perfect now. I'll never do that again. You know, but do you want to change? If you don't want to, if you're, if you're, Eh, it's not that big a deal. Everybody does it anyway. You know that type of thing? Uh, then you're not ready for communion. So am I sorry for my sins? Do I intend to fight against that sin and strive to get rid of it? And then the other key part there is number two. Do I really believe that Jesus died for me and do I believe he gives me his body and blood in this sacrament? Of course, that's the ultimate key part. You know, so that's what we do. By the way, in the hymnal, uh, that's in the pew. We, because of COVID now, we mainly make it so no one has to touch a hymnal because someone else may have touched it somewhere in the last year who may have had a disease. And so we, may, we make it, you can get a nice sterile bulletin and you don't even, it doesn't have to be touched by anyone necessarily. Well, the secretary probably touched it briefly, but you know, uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, but um, in the front of the, in the front of the hymnal is uh, the sm small catechism, which includes Luther's uh, 
uh, explanations to the Ten Commandments. It's also got his questions and answers before you receive the sacrament. And you can walk through there, and it kind of is asking these type of questions. It's a, just a way of making it easier to prepare. Uh, by the way, let's suppose uh, you want, would like to have a hymnal at home. What could you do? Now, there's a wrong answer to this. Stay, yeah, just take one from the church, and no one will ever notice. We got lots of them. That's not the right answer. <laughs> yeah, I can order one for you. I mean, I think they're 30 bucks or something like that. I, I, don't quote me, because everything's gone up. But the last time I ordered one, it was somewhere around $30. Does the church have old hymnals that they know? We do have, the, we do have the, uh, the one before this, the blue hymnals. We've got boxes of them, and that's got the small catechism with the Christian questions and answers. Those I can give you free because we would love to them to do something besides sit in a storage room in a box. So yes, you can get those free. By the way, before I forget, who asked for a catechism? I know they did. Did some, somebody else... If you don't have a catechism, you, I'll give it to you. Do you want, do you want one? You're amazing. You're awesome. I have a very old one. What's that? What did she do? She gave her one a, a catechism. That That's really... Yeah, so I'll bring him next week, but I'm pretty sure I had a couple people that said they needed one. All right, so, um, all right, well, yeah, yeah. all right, look on the last page. It says page 38, and because I'm really trying to get into the next lesson just a little bit here. Um, but on uh, more to think about, question three. Every so often I feel guilty because I don't really read the handouts to you per se. I just give them to you and then we talk about stuff. But I'm going to read part of this. So uh, how do you react to the following? A, it's no good me going to communion. No matter how hard I try, I keep on doing the same old sins. I'll only bring God's judgment on myself. Should that person take communion? Well, we're not guaranteed that we won't sin again, even though we repent of that. So if there's a weakness in your life, that you see that you're not maybe doing the same sin but something similar. Yeah, so you ask for forgiveness. So I think if you forgive for your shortcomings, yes. Yeah, see it says no matter how hard I try. So he's trying to change his sinful life. And, and imagine I'll just pick an obvious one, an alcoholic or a drug addict. They really want to stop. They really want to stop. Is it easy? You know, I'd um, some of you remember, I have permission to talk about this from the family, but Zachary Travis had stopped taking drugs. And after six months, you know, if you stop smoking, 10 years later, do you feel, still feel an urge to light up a cigarette every so often, certain times? Yeah, you do. Even though you're not addicted physically, but you still do. Well, you know, he was going through something stressful and then he wanted to turn back to the, his drugs. First time in six months, his body wasn't used to, he took the same level he did before. You know, that's too much then, and he died. But, you know, if you're striving to change your sinful life, I want you to take communion because you need that help. The Lord's Supper is power, too. It's power for, for changing my life. All right, B, I don't feel any different after I've been to communion. Um, by the way, I had someone who, first time they took communion, they said, I don't get it, Pastor. I, I didn't feel anything. All right. So, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't care what you feel. I want you to remember what just happened. It's not a physical thing. It is a yeah. spiritual and emotional thing. And, and it, what the good stuff that happens is as you think about what you're receiving and who's giving it to you, remembering our Lord Jesus Christ and that he's giving you his body and his blood. And I don't really care about your feelings. I, I'm going to tell you, there was a lady who... Um, who was brought up in the church, knew Christ, loved Christ, very, very dear Christian lady. And um, she had a, a, a time of, of weakness, and she w discovered she was pregnant. And she, and she just couldn't forgive herself, because she, she knew better than that. This is, she knew that was not the right thing to do. And what, she didn't come and talk to me, by the way, I just noticed she had always taken communion every time it was offered, and now she wasn't. She would come to church, but she would not take communion. 
So after about two or three times of not taking communion, I, I called her and said, can I stop over? And I just asked her, I noticed you haven't been taking communion. And she started crying. And she said, I'm not worthy. And then she told me the whole story. And I said, Lord, Supper is especially for someone like you, someone who knows their sin and hurts over it and desperately wants to know they're forgiven. And by the way, she took communion the next Sunday and every Sunday after that while I was still at that church. But she always had tears in her eyes. Every time I gave her communion again, she had tears in her eyes because she was thinking about it. Now I'm going to tell you, the easiest thing, the biggest sin against the Lord's Supper is we just go out there without thinking. Without thinking about what we're receiving, no big deal. You know, communion, you know, part of the re religious ritual. I'm doing my sacred rites. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting brownie points in my God's eyes because I went to church. I'm taking care of the sacrament. Our Roman Catholic friends are brought up that way. I mean, that's, the, but it's not about you know, a checklist of things we got to do. It's about thinking about our sinful condition. A Savior who loves us and died for us and the gift he gives us and what he's saying to us by that. It'll always be special, but you, you know, there, do I always feel giddy and like I want to jump? And, ah, well, what, right now I'm not supposed to. So. <laughs> but no. But when I think about what's happening, there's something inside me that feels at peace. But unless you think here, it won't happen. You know, if I'm just on autopilot. Did you ever get in the car and I, d I drive to the church a lot of times and it's like, I'm not going to the church. What? Why am I here? Why am I on this road? You know, I don't know what happens. The car's on autopilot. It's not good, by the way. Do you ever head for work? <laughs> Even when you don't have to. Yeah, I mean, that's just autopilot. But yeah. All right. Um, other questions. Yeah, yeah well, there's three. All right. Uh, can we be sure we're forgiven if we don't feel forgiven? Yes, you're forgiven. How do we know? God's promise. Feelings are not God. God's word tells us the truth. C, communion is really a great idea. I can do what I want during the week, then on Sunday I can go to communion and square things up with God again. Should they take communion? <laughs> no, you know, I'm not, you know, if I'm just thinking, yeah, I can do whatever I want, you're not ready. If you're striving to change, yeah, I want you to take communion. If you're content with your sin, I don't want you to take communion. All right. All right, anything else on communion? Because then I'm going to change subjects. I'm not going to give you the handout, but we're going to tackle a little bit. All right? Okay. All right. So if I use the word church, and by the way, I want you to tell Denise, oh, yeah, he sat down during class. So you just tell her that. Yeah. I'm sitting. It's on cam. <laughs> um, so um, if you hear the word church, what does it mean? All right, people. You remember, uh, I am the... Ch what, what is that saying where you have fingers? How does that go? I haven't done that for a while. This is people open it up and see all the people. Yeah. So, um, by the way, um, I did that the, the Sunday after the church burned. The church burned, on, I think, on a Monday night or Tuesday morning, something like that. And so the Sunday after, we had church services still, even though this building was gone. Uh, we met in the gym. And, uh, but that was the children's sermon. And I said, you may hear that St. John's Lutheran Church burned down. That's not true. We're still here. You know, building's gone, but the church wasn't touched. We're just fine. You know. Um, so church is people who what? what? Which way are you referring to it? What is church? People who, who go to church together? So like a congregation, the word church can mean St. John's Lutheran Church there. It means congregation, right? <clears throat> People who gather in one place under a steeple and, you know, right? But what else can church Community mean? Of Community of believers worldwide and, quite honestly, not just in this world. So when we talk about the universal church, we're talking about all believers in heaven and on earth. Now, when we talk about vi invisible church, that's another to phrase for the same thing. Um, church, capital C, is all who believe in heaven, on earth. Church, capital C. Church, small c, is congregation, a gathering of local believers. Now, in a congregation, are all of them believers? We hope 
Maybe not. I mean, I, I mean, I'm going to say, yeah, you guys are believers. You come to church. But can people ever come to church without being believers? No, it's not. I want it. So, yeah, I, I, you know, when, when, we, when we had confirmation, you remember what I did? I said, invite lots of people to come with you. I don't care if they go to church or not. Invite them to come. And then for Easter, I want you to invite your family and friends. If they've never go to church before, I want you to invite them. For Christmas, I want you to invite your family and friends. If they've ever, you know, because we believe God's word is powerful and effective and... Who knows what seeds will be planted? So no, it's always good if someone comes to church. So um, yeah, I'm not complaining about that, but I'm just, um, visible church does not necessarily mean everyone's a believer. It's the groups of individual, con you know, that make up congregation. Now, what else, how else do we use the word church? So both of those are about people. A building. A building. So I tell Denise I'm going to the church. You know, so I really mean this building, you know, so, um, but it can, that's one thing, you know. What, how else? Religion. Well, yeah. They need to be church. They're church. Yeah, and you, you can, that's kind of still people, but I, you, you we can say um, uh, Roman Catholic Church, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, uh, uh, Methodist Church, the Southern Baptist Church, what, how is church being used in all of those? Denomination. So it can be a local congregation, all believers, denomination, a building. People call up on the phone, by the way, and they say, what time's church? Now, what do they mean by that? What time is church service? You know, so it can refer to a worship service. And, and what I want you to see is church is used all kinds of ways in our everyday life today. In the Bible, there's two uses of the word church, and only two. It never refers to a building, and never refers to a worship time or something like that. It refers to local believers, a gathering of local believers, and it refers to church, capital C, all believers in heaven and on earth. So that when God uses the word church, he's, he's talking about um, everyone who believes. Now... So what we're going to talk about, this is Lesson 8, and we're mainly going to be looking at this next time. But, um, oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, look at 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to do it. We're going to jump in there because I hate to not. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, 12, 1768, 1768. What were the years of the Civil War? The War of Northern Aggression. Excuse me, I misspoke. <laughs> It ended in 65? Okay, so this is during the restoration time, I guess. Uh, the recovery of the South. Um, 1768, 1 Corinthians 12, 12. What's that? Oh, yeah, you're right. Oh, man, I'm really... Don't go by me. So, um, Constitution, 19, or 1776... So this is eight years before the Revolutionary War started. A little turbulent. The Constitution was in the 1780s, wasn't it? Yeah, it was like a 10, 12 years later. Yeah, I'm in the wrong century. I am, I am embarrassed. Please forgive me. <laughs> Arvis, come on, quit looking at me like that. He's like, man, I would never make a mistake like that. <laughs> All right, 1 Corinthians 12, 12. The body is a unit, though it's made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we are all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the Bible, body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If we're all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, 
while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And then he goes on and starts showing some of the different ways that God appoints people to serve within that one body. Now, what's the point of this section? And I think, I mean, St. Paul is a brilliant guy. He's a brilliant theologian, but he takes concepts and he makes them understandable. So what's his point here as he talks about parts of the body? They all fit together to make the whole body. Yeah, even though they're all different, they're all essential and they make one body. And even though one part is weaker than another, that does not mean that it is not necessary. Yes. Because you can't pinch without a thumb or an index finger. Yeah. And, and that's what I wanted to talk about. Every part of the body is vital. So imagine little toe. I mean, what good is a little toe? No big deal. So, but when you get up in the middle of the night and you're trying to be nice and not turn on the light and wake people up, and then you hit something like that chest of drawers. Yeah, and then, where your furniture is. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And in um, your little toe, even the insignificant part of the body, when it's hurting, what happens? Your, your whole body, you're going to be saying stuff and you're going to be waking up everybody in the whole house, not just in your room. It's just one part of the body affects the whole body. And, and I want you to think about that. So um, they used to say that there are parts of the body that were leftovers of evolution, and I do not believe this, by the way, obviously, uh, and that, you know, so if, you were, if, I, if I, I had to have my gallbladder removed, and really, according to this train of thought, I should've, they should have taken out my what while I was in there? Appendix, because it's, you know, that's just there because what? Because you used to eat grass, and now that we don't eat grass as much, uh, we don't need that. So that was a, a leftover from our days when we're scavenging for food and we don't find enough, so we're eating grass. And uh, that's what they were saying. <laughs> Anyone else heard that? Because, I mean, yeah, that, I mean, that's actually what they taught. Uh, so now, but they did teach, just take them out. You don't need it. Now, now they found out it's actually useful. For what? It is part of the digestive system, and it's, it's, it's vital for the... What's that? Um, I don't remember hearing that. I don't think so. But it's also part of what? What else does the appendix do that's good for the body? It's part of the immune system. What's that? Yeah, it's part of the immune system, too. By the way, they also used to say you don't need your tonsils. Yeah, I mean, I had one sore throat. Five years old. They, they cut, took out my tonsils. Three days in the hospital, by the way. Now you're in there three hours. <laughs> they didn't take it all out, by the way. Didn't they? No, because back then when they removed tonsils, they left something called tonsil tags. It's a little part of the tonsil that remains in your throat because they did not know whether the tonsil benefited or didn't benefit. Now the whole tonsil is removed. All right. That's interesting. But my son, he was harboring strep throat in his tonsils. And he would take uh, penicillin, whatever antibiotic they wanted him to take. And two weeks later, it would be better. And then two to three weeks later, he had have strep throat again. And they, he did that for like years. And they never, we said, why don't you just take his tonsils up? Oh, no, we can't do that. Finally, they agreed to it. But you had to beg them. What's the difference? Back then, they thought unnecessary organ. Now they know it's part of the immune system. It actually has a purpose. All the body has a purpose. So uh, imagine Harvey Sigmund lived across the street, and when he was a youngster playing with uh, well, kind of something equivalent to a cherry bomb, a tragedy happened, and he lost, I think, two and a half of his fingers. Um, so I think uh, like these fingers. Um, so no big deal. He's got seven and a half good fingers, right? Does that affect things? Oh, yeah. Um, a friend of mine uh, was um, riding a riding lawnmower on a pretty slope ditch area and it tipped over and he lost his big toe and half of his next toe. No big deal, he still had eight and a half toes, you know, you know? but big toe is vital for what? Balance. Yeah, balance and walking. Walking is a good thing and we need that. And so 
um, two years later, he's still walking with a very noticeable limp. He, I mean, he's getting around, but it was a big deal. Um, there's a guy who is a marksman. These are all true stories, by the way. And um, he, he really, he won national. This is marksman. You're hitting a paper target from like, I don't know, a half mile away. This, this type of marksman type thing. And um, uh, he uh, lost eyesight in one eye. His shooting eye, by the way. No big deal. He still has one eye. Well, one, he tried to learn to shoot with that eye. Never could, and he was never going to be a world champion again, put it that way. Um, wasn't going to hit the target most of the time. Because um, two eyes add to depth perception and peripheral vision. He lost his driver's license about six months after he lost the, that one eye because he got in two accidents because you have to really turn your head if you don't have peripheral vision. So um, every part of the body is vital. Now apply that to the church. So the standard saying among pastors, and you probably heard it, is 80% uh, of the work of the church is done by 20% of God's people. I would say it's actually 90% of the work is done by 10% of God's people. It's, it, especially in our post-COVID world, it's hard to get people to volunteer. It just is. I mean, that's the reality. And I always keep thinking about, imagine the whole church was using their gifts and talents that God has given to them in their unique way to serve God's kingdom. Would the church grow? I'm almost going to guarantee you. So, so what, what, you know, what I want you to know is you're vital for the work of the church. Now, I'm not telling you what to do because you have to figure that out. So, for example, uh, when I was in uh, middle school, high school, I loved to be in plays and be on stage and play characters and uh, do comedy stuff. And so do I do that? How, do I use that for God's kingdom? Yeah, you're going to see that in VBS again. You know, um, Nicholas Kloss Johnson, my fourth cousin, is coming. Uh, yeah, I think he looks a lot like Santa. Yeah, <laughs> so, yes? Does he eat green beans? No, sadly, the Johnson family is allergic to green beans. It's kind of like a script tonight <laughs> thing. Yeah, it weakens us. It takes away our special abilities. So. Yes, it's hereditary. I like that. I have an excuse for it. See, that's good. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, I use, I, you know, and I do all kinds of stuff. You know I use humor as I'm teaching. That's, so I'm taking things that God gave me. I was the, the second child, and my first oldest child in my family was a bit of a hellion. The third child in my family, my oldest sister, was a bit of a hellion. Don't. If you're watching this, I'm just joking. Okay. And then there's me. So what is my role in the family? Peacemaker. Yeah. And it was. And so I used humor to try and calm people down. You know, I hated tension. I hated bicker. I still do. I'm, I'm terrible at, you know, but, but I will, I'll start doing jokes. I'll start doing humor. And, and I'll have a point. I'll get to something, you know, eventually. But that's what I do. And those are the talents God kind of hardwired into me, so I use them. So I'm doing something I like to do, which is playing a part, and, and I do it for the kingdom of God. You know, so that's what we, you know, we, so we have people that are really, what I, I'm, I'm going to say this, and I mean this in a loving, awesome way. They're, they're computer nerds. You know, you know what I mean? They understand all things computer. That's not me. My daughter has to do everything on my cell phone and say, here, Dad. And, and then she'll try to train me, and I'll say, I'll just bring it back to you when I need to do this again. You know, it's simpler. It's much easier. You know, um, but like for live streaming, Donnie Elbert, genius. And, and you, you'll never know how much time he puts in so that all the stuff we, we uh, live stream is also uh, set up on our YouTube channel. You can watch it any time. I mean, but the stuff he does, I couldn't do. He edits it. You know, so if I say, oh, my hair was messed up, can you take out that part? He could do it. He, I don't ask him to do that. What do I care? You know, but, you know, everybody's got their own gifts and talents. We have people that are accountant type people that know how to, you know, really good with numbers and all that stuff. So, you know what? They help with the church. You know, we, we have all kinds of gifts and talents. We have people with great musical talents. You know what? I love it if you use them for the church. Logan, uh, uh, no, I just blanked out. Anyway, Logan played at, before the 8 o'clock service today. Um, and he did a great job, you know, and, and it's just awesome. And, you know, when uh, Barbara 
filled in last Sunday. Woo, yeah, baby, that's what I'm talking about. Clark has a budding musical genius, and he played. But you find something you are good at, and then you do it for the Lord. And if you can find out what you're good at and don't think, I don't know how I'm going to, well, how could I use it for the Lord? Talk to me. I'll come up with a way. I'll almost guarantee it. You know, um, but just help. By the way, part of that is just being an ambassador for the church. They're in here. They're okay. I'm just holding them late because they were naughty. <laughs> yeah, asking about green beans. So you tell them that's why you have to stay late. The whole class has to stay late because of his misbehavior. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we, we need to stop. But one of the things I, I want you to do, you know, if, if you're joining a church, here's what I want you to do. Go to church each week, if possible. Go to Sunday school each week. As long as you're here, two for one, no extra charge. I mean, that's a bargain. It's a way of buy one, get one free. There you go. <laughs> but also get involved in some way of serving in the church. Why? Because... One, that helps God's kingdom to grow. And two, that's where you'll get to know more people. So you've been helping with some of the, sh the short... By the way, what's your first name? And I know it. Scott. Yeah, Scott. I never forget his first name. <laughs> and, yeah, just wanted to point that out. What's your first name over there? Yeah. So, this is a good class. Yeah, there's three of us. Yeah, baby. That's what I'm talking about. But you've been helping, haven't you? And have you got to know a few more people? Yeah. And Scott, if you would have been able to be here Thursday, we would have got to know all kinds. <laughs> I, I recruited him to help with a skit, and he said yes, and then he found out, well, oh, he's going to be out of town. And I really am not, but it's fun to tease you. He teases me, so I get to tease him back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got witnesses. <laughs> yeah. So, but, you know, that's, it benefits you. When I went to the seminary, I knew no one in the whole state of Indiana. And so I, I go to the seminary. I have to get a job because my dad paid for my first semester of college and my first quarter of the seminary. Back then, it was not free. You know, now, now tuition's free, which is great. But, um, and so I had to pay for my seminary education. So I got a couple jobs immediately. One of them was on campus, and I was working with people in the dining commons. You know what? The people I worked with became my friends. And then I, I got involved in the basketball team, and the people I played basketball with became my best friends. Because, you know, sitting in class, you don't get to know anyone. Sitting in church, you don't get to know anyone. It's when you're working side by side together and you're laughing. Um, uh, Paul Nielsen went on a trip when he first joined to uh, Alabama, I think it was. They were working on a home. And he said... Um, that was the most fun he had ever had. And I think he was exaggerating because I told him, what about getting married to your wife? That had to be a better day than, you know, and having your children. No, oh, you know. <laughs> so I tried to set him straight. But, um, and he said, we did, you know, we worked, they work 10, 12 hours a day, they really do. But they have so much fun, it doesn't feel like work. And, and he, he, Arvis, you've been part of some of that stuff. Arvis stays up all night cooking sometimes for, our, uh, for some of our big meals. And, you know, you're just talking, just teasing each other. Yeah, it's who you're with. But you, those, they, those people become your friends. Yeah. So anyway, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for bringing us together this day and uh, sharing your word with us. Help us to truly not just uh, delight in your church, but be the church and the uh, church. Be, be part of the body that serves and helps the kingdom to grow. In Christ's name we pray, amen.